Hello and welcome to the Acoustic Communication Lab. I'm Rohini Balakrishnan. I'm a professor at the Center for Ecological Sciences. And in the next several minutes, I will tell you a little bit about uh, what we do in my lab. And to do that, I will have to share my presentation. So uh, I will take a minute to make that happen. So broadly, what we do in my lab is to study how animals communicate with each other using sounds. And the kinds of problems that we look at is how they manage to communicate in noisy natural environments, which could range from rainforest choruses to uh, urban or rural um, settings. Um, we've looked at how these animals manage to pick up and locate a single collar among many in natural environments. Uh, we've looked at the mate finding strategies that signalers and receivers uh, might use. Um, the second part of what we look at is whether uh, acoustic signals play any role in mate choice, as well as alternative mating strategies that males and females might use to find and choose mates. And finally, we look at natural selection on signalers and receivers. Uh, so we look at predator-prey interactions. We look at what kind of risks signaling and responding to signals brings for these signalers and receivers who are often prey. And we look at the behavioral responses of prey to predation risk. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of detail about <clears throat> all of this by giving you some examples. So the main system that we use in the lab are crickets and bush crickets. And one of the species that we have used for several years now is this uh, tree cricket, which is um, uh, Acanthus uh, henry. Here is the male and there is the female. Uh, males sort of sit on bushes, may sing from the edge of a leaf, uh, they produce sound by rubbing their wings together. And each species has its own specific kind of call. And if females are around in the vicinity and they hear the call of their species, then they will sort of walk towards it and find the male. And uh, if the male is lucky, then the female will mate with him, right? And all of this occurs typically on bushes Habitats such as this, these habitats are actually just outside a uh, little north of Bangalore. Um, as you can see, they are drier habitats and the bush is Hyptus suaviolens, which is a host plant for this cricket. Uh, we have used this system and this field site to ask several questions. Um, we, some of the kinds of questions that we ask for example, uh, how do females recognize males of their species based on song and locate them? Do females choose between males um, based on their songs? Are male songs indicative of male quality, such as size and condition? And the effects of the ecological context on what happens to the signals and the preferences for these signals. And what we mean by the ecological context is um, you know, how males space themselves or uh, what kind of habitats that they might uh, inhabit and signal from. I'm going to give you a few more specific examples. And um, it appears I cannot okay, move the screen. All right. So let me give you one example. Okay. And here is an example. Um, Point around again, yeah. Where you can do lab experiments, for example, where you can have a female and she is offered the choice between two calls. They're basically the same call of a male of her species, but played at two different uh, intensities. That is, one is louder and one is less loud. And what you see in these results is basically that whenever you give them a choice between a call that's louder and one that's less loud, females will always pick and move towards the 
louder call. So females prefer louder songs when they are offered a choice in lab experiments. But how does this translate into whether they can use loudness for choice in the field? So to do that, you have to go out to the field and what we see over here are the positions of individual calling males as mapped by one of my PhD students, Rithik Deb. And once you know where each of the males is and how loudly each of them calls, as well as what happens to these sounds when they are emanated uh, from the cricket and move through the habitat, then you can construct these kinds of maps, which is basically there is a male calling in the center. And what the circle tells you is how far out his call travels till it can no longer be heard by the female. So with an understanding of the male positions about the calls themselves, how they transmit, and something about female hearing, you can figure out how many males a female at any given position in this field is likely to hear. And when you do that exercise, what you find is that females in the field rarely hear more than one male at a time. Only 15% of the time, they actually hear more than one male. So although if they heard two calls, they would go to the louder one, in the field, they rarely hear two calls. So this is just to make the point that one really has to examine these things both in the lab to understand the intricacies of what females might prefer, and then to take it out into the field and see how it works out there. We also um, work on alternative mating strategies. For example, this tree cricket male, some tree cricket males actually chew a hole in a leaf and then sing uh, by putting their wings up next to it. And um, that, yes, let me show you the video. That amplifies the song. So it makes the song <clears throat> much louder. The leaf acts as an acoustic amplifier. And when one studies this and asks, not everybody makes these amplifiers, who makes these amplifiers? What you find is that less favored males, males that are smaller, so females tend to favor large males over smaller males. So smaller males or those whose calls are not as loud are more likely to build these amplifiers, to build these baffles, and then make their songs sound louder, okay? And this induces females to mate longer with them. How do you come to such conclusions? Well, you can do field observations, which is, for example, shown here. So you go out in the field and you ask who is calling from uh, these leaf baffles and which males are not, and you measure their body size, and you find that on average, the bafflers are smaller than the non bafflers Similarly, you can look at um, whether the males who have baffles are actually louder when they're calling without baffles or softer. And what you find is that those who use baffles tend to be those with softer calls. You can do similar experiments in the lab. You can bring the animals in and offer them leads and once again, ask the same question. So doing it both in the lab and the field, you can come to this conclusion, which is that less favored males are more likely to build baffles and sound louder. Other kinds of mating, uh, mate finding strategies that uh, we have examined include in this canopy bush cricket species. Uh, this calls from jackfruit tree canopies and it's a Western Ghat species. And what we discovered was that these have a duetting strategy to find each other. That is, the male will put out a call and the female will reply. So I'm going to show you this by playing this um, video um, to you. Once I'm able to get to it, one minute. Right. So what you're seeing here is the female and she's standing at the base of a T-shaped branch. This has been set up in the lab. What you're hearing is the call of the male being called from one speaker. And if you watch carefully, you'll see that the female 
is shaking the leaf. Okay? And she's doing it every time she hears a chirp. So listen again. Chirp, shake. And what we've shown is that this generates a vibrational signal that can travel through the branch. And the male then uses that. He'll stop calling and he'll use the vibrational signal to come and find the branch. So this is a multimodal web in which the male calls acoustically and the female responds with a vibrational signal that travels through the bark. And one might ask, what is it that uh, allows such systems to evolve, what has driven such systems to evolve? So if you think about signals and mate finding strategies, there are many, uh, there are many, many factors that might affect what kinds of signals evolve and what kinds of strategies evolve. These are uh, influenced by many different factors, including masking interference, which is calls of so many other species who are also calling around you because most species in nature don't call alone. There are so many other individuals calling together which can interfere with the signal of a specific caller. And that might change the way a caller calls. That is, it might change the time or it might change where the caller calls from or over evolutionary time, it might change the structure of the signal. Similarly, the acoustics of the habitat, how the sounds, these particular signals, these particular sound signals, what happens to them when they are put out into the habitat? Do they you know, become very soft very rapidly? Do they degrade very rapidly? And different habitats, for example, calling from the ground or calling from the canopy or calling from the understory can influence these in very different ways. And this could drive signals to have particular structures and signalers to call from particular uh, spots, particular places. Another important uh, factor is predation. For example, when you have uh, males calling so loudly, they become conspicuous. And so you imagine that they will attract predators. So one of the things we've been looking at more recently is this connection between predators, signals, and mate finding. So what role do predators play in driving the structure of signals and of signaling behavior? How much risk um, does calling or moving towards calls, walking or flying involve for these crickets? What are the risks of different behaviors? And does it matter what kind of signal structure you have? So to examine this, we have been looking at it in our second field site, which is, um, which you can see over here in the Western Ghats. So Bangalore is about due east from here. Um, this is very close to Kudremukh National Park. And you can see this is a, a wet evergreen forest, mountainous area in the Western Ghats. And we work in and around this national park and have been working there for 20 years. We have a field station there. And um, a long time ago, we actually characterized the cricket and bush cricket that is catered in the community of Kudremuk National Park. And I'm playing you some of these beautiful songs. This is the song of the Zandastori cricket. This is the false leaf. This is Mikopoda, who lives on the ground and has this wonderful raspy call. This is the canopy bush cricket that I told you about, whose female responds with vibration. And this very cut cut frog-like sound comes from a large cricket called a waiter. Okay. So we have this community of about 20 species who all live together and call together. And we have studied many things about them, including how they manage to communicate um, successfully with each other, given that all of them are calling together. Uh, we've looked at how the signals of all of these species change when they are put out in the forest environment. But more recently, what we've done is to ask, um, what kinds of predators do these animals have? So we have looked at the bat community in and around Kudremok, and there are about 20 species of bats. And we narrowed down 
the big cricket eaters, this is Megadamus pashma, the lesser false vampire bat. And we've been working with this bat for the past few years. What you see is if you go to a roost of spasma, you will see all these wing and ovipositor remains. They eat a lot of orthopterans, they eat a lot of crickets. And that's what you see over here in these pie charts. The reds show you the um, bush crickets that have been eaten. And you can see that a large percentage of their diet actually consists of that. Not only that, if you stare closely at these remains for a while, you will realize that many, many more females have been eaten than males. So these structures are ovipositors, which belong to females. How can that be? Because females are silent, right? And it's the males that call. So to look at that, um, we tried to ask what kinds of behaviors are more dangerous. Um, is it the calls of the males that tend to attract bats more? Or is it the movement of the females? And you can do that in the field site in large enclosure experiments of this kind. So we have speaker over here. Um, we have two speakers, one of which will play a call. This is the control, which will be silent. And we have a reward. This is inside a large outdoor enclosure in the field, and there is a bat in this enclosure. And what you can hear is background noise. And short, this is the call being played from this. The call of this calls. And you will see there. And the bat comes down. Right? So the bats do come down to these calls, but how often do they do? So if you play the calls of many different species, what you'll find is that bats come down about 30% of the time. On the other hand, if you induce flight okay, in a tethered female, you get a female to fly, they come down 100% of the time, which suggests very counterintuitively that flying is actually riskier than calling. And so the story that we are working with right now is with this false leaf catered it, which produced this whistling call. It's eaten in large numbers, both males and females, by this bat. And the female of this species, instead of um, uh, flying or walking towards males, produces this um, vibrational reply. So our hypothesis is that perhaps these females respond to the male signals with vibrational signals. Uh, because of the risk of bat predation if they fly. And this is a hypothesis that we are currently testing. More recently, we've also started working with moths uh, in the same area, looking at the moth community and which moths are getting eaten by these bats. And we hope to find out uh, what is it that's different about moths that get eaten, moth species that get eaten, and moth species that don't get eaten in this community. Having looked at it at this very, very fine level, um, it's also important to then move out and ask, well, what's really going on in the wild? Because most of these experiments are in enclosures, right? So to be able to answer that, we have started looking at landscape level movement because you need to look at where the predators are, where are they going, where are the prey, how do they move to be able to understand these predator-prey interactions in the wild. And to do that, we, of course, have started now with radio telemetry. So let me put the pointer, yeah. So we put radio transmitters on these bats. They're quite small bats. And what you can see over here um, is a map of the area. And each of these sets of dots is the locations that we have found one individual bat over multiple nights. And what you can see quite clearly from this map is that different individual bats seem to focus on different um, foraging areas. So this is where they go every night and they go back night after night. So it's quite fascinating because they have fidelity to their foraging sites. Um, we can also track them within a night and see how they move across this landscape. So we're getting a lot of data on how these predators move. Very recently, just a few weeks ago, we've managed to put radio transmitters onto the prey on some of these bush crickets. And my student, uh, Kasturi, is currently out tracking. OK. So that's the kind of thing we do. So what does it take to do such research? Well, uh, you need 
a passion is the most important thing. You need a passion for animal behavior and animal sounds. For any kind of research, of course, you need a lot of patience, but particularly for behavioral work, you need patience and perseverance. All of the systems we work on are nocturnal. So anyone working with me uh, needs to have a willingness to work at night, whether it is in the lab or in the field and be comfortable with that. And of course, uh, if one wants to do scientific research, it's important to have intellectual curiosity and an open mind and try new approaches wherever required to answer a question. So if it requires the work to be done out in the field, one will have to go out and work in the field. If it requires to be complemented by experiments in the lab, then one requires to do that. And I have been extremely fortunate over the course of the last 20 years to have a whole array of absolutely wonderful students, postdocs and field assistants uh, who have done all this and more. And I look forward to welcoming others into this large and wonderful family. Thank you.